Well, I'm just taking a look at the uh, iPod Nano's um, LCD interface uh, with a view to see if we can get these displays to do anything useful because um, they're, they're quite cheap, nice little square displays. Um, I just thought I'd do a quick video on probing high frequency signals because this interface uses LVDS signals at around 100 megahertz. Um, obviously I'll be doing a, a video or two about the actual um, reverse engineering process but I just want to talk about the actual probing to actually get clean um, signals on the scope so you can actually see what's going on to um, make a start. When you're probing high frequency signals um, the actual probe details are, become very important. Um, this signal on here is a fairly low level signal at about 100 megahertz so um, let's take the naive approach and we just stick our probe in with our ground lead as you would for sort of uh, a fairly uh, bog standard signal and look what we get not far off a sine wave. Now that is almost certainly not the real clock waveform. The other thing you notice is if I um, just put my hand just near the ground lead we actually see some changes in the signal which makes us suspicious that there's something not entirely uh, correct going on. Now the problem there is this um, high frequencies, this ground lead has quite significant inductance so um, the trick when you're probing is to just throw away the ground lead and you, but what you need to do is almost any scope or even cheap ones will have some accessible metal near the tip and you need to get a ground as close as possible to that tip. Now these um, are quite like, these are Tektronics um, 6131 probes which are about my favourite probes because they've got a nice sort of flexible cable and they're nice and small and they come with these little springs. Uh, quite a lot of good quality probes will come with something like this. Um, the, the idea is that you can stick these around the neck of the probe and you've then got a very close ground point that you can um, which is going to have much lower inductance, so um, for using... Uh, this doesn't always apply just to high frequencies. Uh, a very common um, time where you really need to get your probing right is on a switch mode power supply or switching regulator because the circulating currents are very high and the rise times can be quite fast. The inductance of a ground lead can become very significant. So if you want to measure something like, for example, the ripple on the output of a switching regulator, you really need to be connecting like very close to the output capacitor. Um, otherwise the inductance of the probe lead is going to give you a completely the um, incorrect result. Right, so now we've got this with our um, spring pro ground and you can now see we've got something that looks a lot more like a square wave. We've still got a bit of um, bounce on there but uh, we can actually get a slightly better idea of where the edges actually are if we want to start looking at the data that's been clocked by this. Even with this setup we do still have some inductance. We've got the inductance of this spring lead but there's also um, where I've connected this board in the, the, the link to the ground PCB ground plane is sort of fairly thin wire, that's about uh, sort of t um, 8 millimeters or so of fairly thin wire. So one quick way to know whether you can improve the probing is just to um, temporarily just add a low inductance path. Uh, generally thicker wire has um, lower inductance because your inductance is you think a bit a bit like resistance. Um, so the lower the, yeah, the thicker the wire generally will have lower, lower um, inductance as well as lower resistance. Um, so if we actually just get a, try and get a really good solid ground there, let's see what effect this has if we connect the right at the tip of the probe up to that uh, ground plane point. You see that actually loses a little bit of that ringing on the top. It probably doesn't have a huge effect on the, um, the edge position but it shows that we are getting a cleaner signal so at high frequencies this might actually um, give us a bit more of an advantage in trying to look at the um, data in detail. One thing to bear in mind is that um, high frequency signals quite often work at fairly low impedances so um, the point about a traditional scope probe is it's designed to present a fairly high impedance to the load to, sorry, to the circuit you're testing so it doesn't load it down too much but if the circuit's already operating at a low impedance and this is an LVDS signal so it's probably going into something like a 100 ohm termination you don't actually need that high impedance so what you can do is use a much simpler probing system all this is is a bit of 50 ohm um, coax cable the BNC socket with a resistor on it, it's a 470 ohm so the optimum, the ideal for a times 10 would be a 450 ohm but I mean this is close enough and our scope has got, is set to 50 ohms input impedance so that this and the scope impedance forms a, um, a, 50, uh, a 10 to 1 divider but because it's much lower impedance the capacitance of the cable is going to have much much less effect 
than it would on a uh, high impedance signal and because we've cut this, res this resistor really short the direct capacitive loading is very small and the capacitance of the cable is decoupled by um, the resistor which is basically the same way these probes work just we're working on a lower scale um, so let's just see what the, this looks like this is a crude a, a crude uh, lash up if this works well I'll uh, make up a, a, a better version but it's worth remembering for example if you picked up like a nice high bandwidth scope cheap on ebay and um you can't afford decent probes for it if you're probing low impedance circuits you know you can make something up which will be fairly effective so um let's just have a look at uh what sort of signal we'll get we'll ground this to the uh the ground on the the main pcb as well to maximize our signal quality you can see the scopes on um, 50 ohms mode. If your like, scope doesn't have a 50 ohm mode, you can just use uh, an inline terminator. You can get um, things which like a BNC plug and socket with uh, an internal resistor, or you could even make one up. It's just a case of having the 50 ohms as close as you can get it to the scope input. That's the only really critical thing. So that top trace is the best trace I could get using the standard probe just stored. So um, let's have a look at what we get with this probe. And you can see we've actually got a pretty decent signal, and that's at least as good as, if not slightly better than the um, the real probe. So that's a pretty clean signal, certainly clean enough from the point of view of trying to sort of decode protocols and so on. So for yeah, for a length of cable and a resistor, it's probably quite a nice solution. Right, so I just tidied that up. I made some leads using this is RG one seven four coax. It's just a bit thinner, so it's a little bit um, easier to handle on a small situation. So we've got those resistors on the end. And we've now got some nice clean waveforms that we can start um, investigating some reverse engineering. That's sort of 110 megahertz clock on a, this is a 350 meg scope. Um, the other nice thing, of course, is um, you know these cost almost nothing, so you can just solder them in. You don't don't have to worry about um, not damaging the tip of your nice sort of proper probe. They're just uh, a nice sort of cheap solution that does give you a decent. Um, decent clean signal you can just solder them and uh, not worry about it and um, you can see we, we've now got a nice clean, yeah, clean enough vision um, view of the data we can actually look at the fine detail we can you know do work out individual bit values um, one thing uh, you can see there's obviously a slight skew between the two channels um, the scope has the ability to free for an individual probe to actually add an off a time offset so we can actually get those two line up not necessarily with each other but in a way that makes it e makes it easy for us to figure out you know the um, the data values just as a sort of convenient reference you see this is actually ddr data you've got the uh, data changing on both clock transitions but so we can actually see that cleanly enough to um yeah if necessary manually work out one bit at a time what each um, byte value is